Today on the podcast, we talk weather. Did you know that it snows in Jerusalem? Or that the lowest spot on earth is in Israel? We'll discuss all those things and more today on Digging Deeper. Welcome to Digging Deeper, the podcast where we talk about the geography, archaeology, people, and cultures of the lands of the Bible. By exploring these areas, we hope to broaden your understanding of the biblical narrative. You can learn more about all of us here at Appian Media and watch our free video series at www.appianmedia.org. Before we start today, we want to talk about our sponsor, Memo Marketing. Recently, Appian Media has teamed up with Memo Marketing to update our website, as well as provide a number of other marketing ideas for helping us to promote the work that we are doing. We are happy to have them on board, and we will say more about them later in the program. So, Barry, last time you got to quiz me a lot and interview me. Right, right. Time to turn the tables. No, no. So you've already given us a little bit of your background, but tell us about your background and your education. Okay. Uh, I grew up in North Alabama and uh, always really kind of had an interest in weather. Um, back in the in the late ni- in the early 1970s, uh, there was a number of incidents uh, weather related that happened in North Alabama. There was a tornado outbreak and things like that. Because of that, I always had an interest in weather. And uh, after high school, I ended up going to Florida College, which is a two year private junior college near Tampa, Florida. And from there, I transferred up to Florida State University and uh, began working on a degree in meteorology. And after a couple of years, that's exactly what I had. Uh, I had a degree in meteorology with minor in physics and math and a lot of other boring things. Um, But actually, the best thing I got out of Florida State was not the degree, but I actually uh, got a wife out of it. Uh, When I went to uh, Florida State, I looked around the classroom, and uh, uh, there was only one female in the class, (laughs) in the meteorological classes. And... uh, um, I guess I beat everybody else uh, out. And uh, anyway, ended up meeting Tabitha there. She also has a degree in meteorology. Soon afterwards, we were married. I've been married for nearly 28 years. And uh, so if you were to drop by our house, and it's a little odd having two meteorologists in the same house, but people have told us that we're a little odd anyway. So, But if you were to actually drop by our house at any time, there's probably the weather channels on. It's just kind of on a rotating basis at our house. And living in North Alabama, I'm sure uh, there's reason for it to be on, especially during tornado season. Yeah, that's right. That's right. We, we kind of keep an eye out. We've had a couple of, of close calls, uh, but uh, we we really do enjoy the weather, really all seasons, because uh, um, it, it's really interesting because one of the things that I was told as I was going through college was when you're studying math or science or really any subject, you need to look at it in a different aspect, I would say. And that is, you know, when you're studying about science and meteorology, you're, you're studying about God. I mean, it really is. I mean, God invented science and God invented the weather and he maintains the earth as it is today. And so when you're studying meteorology, you're actually studying about God. I tell parents a lot of that uh, when they're worried about their children and studying science. I'm like, they shouldn't be afraid of science because if they look at it objectively, they will see God. Yeah, that's right. It's, it's just another Bible class. You really have to kind of look at it like that. You may not be studying the stories in the Bible, but uh, you're studying about what God created. And so that's really important. Now, you're not doing uh, weather as a profession, no. but I'm sure you still, from time to time, it's important to other people and they're they're asking you questions about it. Oh, yeah. We get, uh, Tabitha and I both get asked about uh, weather uh, all the time. And uh, it, that really actually means a lot to us because that means that people, you know, value our opinion. Uh, most of the time, the information that we give them is uh, the same information that they could go if they went to the National Weather Service website <laughs> or something like that. But that's okay. I tell you what really interests us about weather is when we open up our Bibles and we see stories in the Bibles that really have a weather impact to them. And there's a number of them, I'm sure. There are. I mean, I mean you can you can think, well, there's there's big stories like the flood. Mm-hmm. Obviously, the the flood is a, a, a huge weather story. Uh, it's even debatable about whether or not it had actually rained on the earth prior to that event. You know, maybe not. And so maybe the first time that rain at water started falling from the sky, this was the first time they had seen that. Uh, there's passages in the Bible that seem to indicate that the that the earth was uh, nourished from water from from the ground basically up until that time, and so 
Uh, obviously, the, the flood is a huge uh, weather event. Uh, but then you move to stories in the New Testament. You know, Jesus calms a storm while on the Sea of Galilee. He and his disciples are out there on the boat, and a storm comes up, which it can while, you know, while, you're, while you're there. And uh, Jesus calms that storm. In fact, it's, it's interesting. In uh, one of the episodes of Following the Messiah, there's a scene in which Jeremy and I are sitting on the back porch of a hotel. We're eating the fish. We were talking about uh, you know, Peter and Andrew being fishermen. Yeah, and so you're sitting there eating the tilapia. That's right. We're sitting there eating the tilapia. And uh, there's actually a a cut that you can kind of see on one of the the behind-the-scenes videos in which we're just laughing. But the reason we were laughing was because the wind had come up, and it was blowing these these deck chairs across the back porch of this hotel. It was funny because that— that wind did not exist when we sat down to start, but by the time, you know, 10, 15 minutes later, when we were in the middle of the scene, boy, that wind was blowing hard. That's been one of my goals in life is to be at the Sea of Galilee, Yes, which is really just a big lake, right. and watch a storm happen. Oh, no, I, I, I totally agree, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about that in, in just a minute, but you have these major stories in the Bible, you know, like the flood or Jesus on the Sea of Galilee, but what I really love are the are, are the small little pieces of content in there about weather. Because there's a passage in John the 10th chapter in which Jesus is visiting Jerusalem. And it says in verse 22 of John 10, it says, at the time of the feast of dedication took place in Jerusalem, it was winter and Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. Okay, so what, what that means is that during the time of dedication, which would have been uh, in the December time mm-hmm. frame as far as our calendars are concerned, uh, it was winter, and he, he was in Jerusalem, and Jerusalem is just about 2,700 feet in elevation, and it can get really cold in Jerusalem during the winter. That's another thing I'd love to see is snow, Yeah, you know, being in Jerusalem with snow, but yeah, I'm sure it was cold. As I said, I live in North Alabama, and every winter we get three or four one-inch snows a year, and then we'll get like a two or three-inch snow, and then once every 10 years we'll get a six or eight-inch snow. Jerusalem is kind of the same way. Uh, you know, every winter they'll have a few dustings to an inch or so, and then about once every six or eight years they'll have a real big snow, you know, maybe as much as uh, eight or ten inches. It can get really cold in Jerusalem, uh, especially during the winter. There's also another passage, and this is just a little nuance in the text, where it talks about uh, in in the book of Ezra, Ezra's talking to the people because they have been mixing their marriages with people uh, with other nations. Mm-hmm. And he actually calls them all to Jerusalem to talk about this. And it's, it, it says it took place the ninth month, which would have been during our winter, during the time of, of Jerusalem's winter. And uh, it says that the people were standing outside and it said they were nervous and shaking because of two reasons. First of all, the sin that they had committed. But also, it's, it distinctly says they were nerv- they were shaking because of the pouring rain. Oh, wow. And so, but that would have happened, I mean, if you can imagine all these people out in Jerusalem standing outside in the pouring rain, it was probably in the mid-40s temperature, you know, and they fi- it's interesting because they finally decide, you know what, we can't settle this here. We need to go, and they come up with another plan on how to settle this, but it's because the people were standing outside in the rain. It would be very cold. It would be. Now, uh, when you mention the winter, yeah, and is that how the seasons are in in Israel, like we expect in the U.S., to have the four seasons. Right, right. Well, well, Israel, of course, is in the northern hemisphere, and so they have uh, spring, summer, winter, and fall the same way that we do. But you can really divide their their weather seasons up into two different parts. It's the dry season and the wet season. The wet season starts in mid-October and goes through Oh, middle middle of April, maybe the first of May, and then between the first of May and October, Israel gets no rain. Knowing that helps you to uh, kind of look at stories in kind of a different way when they're talking about that. Absolutely. Now, does that affect you with leading tours and when you choose to go on a tour? Yeah. Well, of course, people ask me all the time. They said, "When's the best time to visit Israel?" And uh, my kind of tongue and cheek answer is. Anytime you can get to go to <laughs> yeah. Israel, it's a great time to visit Israel. But also, you have to think about what you want to accomplish. Like, for instance, I really enjoy leading tours in the summertime. Now, here's the downside to that. The downside of that is it's warm. 
going to be it hot. It can be really warm, especially when you're down in the Jordan Rift Valley, down where the Sea of Galilee is, because Sea of Galilee sits 700 feet below sea level. It's just kind of in a little bowl. And uh, so that warm air gets down in there, and it can it can really start to cook. It starts I mean, it, to bake. Yeah, it can it can easily be in the you know mid to upper nineties in Tiberias, but in Jerusalem you you've gone up to twenty seven hundred feet in elevation. It, it's easily ten to fifteen degrees cooler up in Jerusalem, and so I like going in the summertime because you you have no rain. Six eight months prior to us going, I can set a schedule. And I know that we'll be able to keep it because there's no, there's rain. no rain. Now, I, I also like you know going over there in March and April. I'm sure it's a lot greener at it's that time. It's a lot greener, especially up in Galilee, because they've, they're just ending the rainy season. But it's cooler, and the days are not quite as long. And so it's an interesting dynamic in when you, when you want to go to Israel and what you want to see. Got to be a lot, of, a lot of thought processes about trade-offs for what, what you're really Ex- wanting to, exactly. to get out of the trip. Exactly. Exactly. That's right. Um, I have people that uh, obviously when the days are longer and the temperature is warmer, you can do a lot more things. But uh, obviously it's a little warmer during the time. And so that that really is difficult. So if I'm going to go to Israel during the rainy season. Right. Is it going to be rain all throughout the country or are there areas that uh, the weather patterns might be a little different? Well, uh, it does fluctuate here, here and there. Um, there's a general rule that says the higher in elevation you are or the farther north you are, then you have a lot of rain. Okay. And so, for instance, uh, you know, the cities that are in the central mountain range get a, get a lot of rain because they're high in elevation. And the cities that, for instance, are in the farther northern part of the country, like Dan or where Caesarea Philippi was, mm-hmm. they get a lot of rain just because they're farther north. Okay. And so um, one of the things that people don't realize about Israel, a lot of times people think, Israel is hot and dry. That's all it is, just a big yeah. desert. Uh, and that's that's really not the case. Now, there are a lot of places in Israel, especially when you get down to the wilderness of Zin, places like that, where it is it is warm. And, and it's down in the south. And it's dry. But it's down in the south. That's right. After the very northern part of the country is Mount Hermon. Mount Hermon is over 9,000 feet in elevation. In fact, there's a ski, you know, there's a ski resort on that mountain. You don't picture that. No, you don't. You don't. Uh, You never hear the news people talking about the opening of ski season in Israel, but they have (laughs) that every single year uh, because there's a huge ski resort up there on Mount Hermon, but it's because uh, it's high in elevation, gets lots of rain, and in the wintertime gets lots of snow, and so people go up there and enjoy that all the time. I have a couple more questions for you, but right now we need to take a break uh, because we have a sponsor that we need to mention. All right. Is your business in need of a website redesign or a brand new website altogether? Let me take a second to tell you about our sponsor for the Digging Deeper podcast, Memo Marketing. They are a full service marketing company that can take care of all of your company's marketing needs, even including websites. Right. And when we uh, first approached Memo Marketing about updating our website, uh, we had some fairly hard requirements for them. We needed uh, video plug-in so that our videos could play. We need an e-commerce site so that we could sell the things we wanted to sell. And they were really good to work with. They helped us all along the way. That They've had a lot of experience with this. And so by the time we got to the product with the website that was published, it was exactly what we needed. And the neat thing is with today, you not only need a website that works on your laptop and your desktop, but you also need something that's going to work on your your portable device, whether it's the iPad or the iPhone. And I know I've had great success with pulling it up on my on my phone, and it, it works just as well. And so if your company is looking for a new website, go ahead and check out Memo Marketing. You can learn more from them at memomarketinggroup.com. That's memomarketinggroup.com. Now, Barry, we talked about the location in the country, um, and you touched a little bit about uh, elevation and the height of Mount Hermon and the height of Jerusalem. How much does elevation play a part in the weather? Well, in it's a good question. It, it it plays actually a huge role. One of the things that a lot of people don't realize is just how small uh, the country of Israel is. I mean, if you take the distance between Dan and Beersheba, which is kind of what we read about in scriptures, when, especially when you get around the United Kingdom time of David, that's about 150 miles north to, north to south. Very small. But right. But east to west, uh, it's probably only 50 or 60 miles wide. So this is an extremely small piece of land. With that being said, 
it's incredibly geographically diverse. So beginning on the western side, you have the coastal plain. Obviously, this is the area of land close to the Mediterranean Sea. It's about 10 to 12 miles wide. As you would think, it's really flat. You know, it may rise a few hundred feet in elevation, you know, as the farther east you go, but it's fairly flat. From there, you immediately go up into the central mountain range. Okay. And the central mountain mountain range can be up to 3,000 feet in elevation. That's a big jump. It is. It really is. And so this is where the cities of uh, Hebron, Bethlehem, Jericho, Shiloh, Shechem, this is where all those cities are located. Now, remember, those cities are only about, uh, you know, 30, 35 miles from the coast, but you've now already jumped 3,000 feet in elevation. Okay. As you go further east, as soon as you cross the Central Mountain Range, you jump way down below sea level into the Jordan Rift Valley. So this is where Jericho would be located, the Sea of Galilee, the Dead Sea. They're all in this Jordan Rift Valley. Then, of course, the the land rises again east of the Jordan River into the Trans-Jordan Plateau. So the modern country of Jordan. That's right, the modern country of Jordan. But these these huge changes in elevation uh, can make a huge difference. For instance, the rain that falls, temperature and rain. You know, think about the distance between Jericho and Jerusalem. It's only about, you know, 13 or 14 miles as the crow flies, but there is over 3,000 feet in, of elevation difference between the two. Yes. And so, you know, what happens is most of the year, the winds blow off the Mediterranean coast, and that, that warm air, warm, moist air from the, from the water rises when you get to the central mountain range, and, of course, it rains. That causes condensation, clouds form, and it eventually rains on the central mountain range. Well, those same air currents will then go down into this central uh, to, to the Jordan Rift Valley and dry up. Okay. And so Jericho, which as I said is is really close to Jerusalem, gets very little rain. J- Jerusalem averages about 22 inches of rain per year. Now, what does that mean? Well, it's better it, it's neat if we can compare that to another city that we're familiar with, you know, take London. Now, okay. Known for rain. It rains rainy. all the time in London. Yeah, it's hard to see a picture of London without somebody holding an umbrella <laughs> or anything like that. In fact, uh, I, a little secret here. My favorite movie of all time is The Sound of Music. My second favorite movie is Mary Poppins. Okay. So I guess if Julie Andrews would walk into the studio right here, I'd probably freak out. Think about what Mary Poppins brought to the Banks house. She had a carpet bag and, and what? An umbrella. And an umbrella. That's right. Why? It's because it always rains in London. Well, London gets about 26, 28 inches of rain per year. Jerusalem gets about 22. Uh, that's pretty close. Yeah. So Jerusalem gets almost as much rain as, as London does, but you don't think about it that way. It's because of, of how the rain falls. But you can even see those differences in those elevations just because like King Herod. King Herod had a huge palace in Jerusalem. He also had another palace 12 miles away in Jericho. Why did he have that palace? Because he needed someplace warm to go to during the wintertime. That makes sense. They yeah. didn't have a lot of the uh, modern amenities we do. That's right. And so um, it, it's interesting, too, that when I do lead tours over there, we usually go up to the Galilee area first. And so it's warm there around the Sea of Galilee. But then we'll eventually end the tour with several nights in Jerusalem. And when you get up to Jerusalem, get up to Jerusalem, just like we read in the Bible, it's noticeable the difference in the air because it's cooler up there in the in the you know in the Central Mountain Range. Probably especially right after coming through Jericho. Yeah, that's right. It's usually very warm in Jericho. Then you come up the come up the hill. And of course, to me, what's interesting about that is that. If you take the time to learn a little bit about the weather, uh, it helps you to understand the Bible stories even more. Oh, absolutely. I appreciate you sharing this with us. No, oh, you're welcome. At 1 Samuel, the 12th chapter, we have an account of Samuel addressing the people of Israel as he's getting older. The people have requested a king, and Samuel has anointed Saul as that king. However, Samuel is not happy with Israel's decision and wants to speak to the people. They have gathered at Gilgal, which is a few miles northeast of Jericho, and as we've said previously, only gets a few inches of rain per year. At the end of his speech, Samuel says the following in verse 16, Now therefore, and stand still, and see the great thing that the Lord will do before your eyes. Is it not the wheat harvest today? 
I will call upon the Lord that he may send thunder and rain, and you shall know and see that your wickedness is great, which you have done in the sight of the Lord, asking for yourselves a king. So Samuel called upon the Lord, and the Lord sent thunder and rain that day, and all the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. Every time I read that passage, I think, why did this event have such a profound effect on the people? Well, I can think of three reasons. First of all, God had made it thunder and rain. I mean, that's remarkable. Can you imagine what that would have looked like as Samuel said the words and it immediately started to thunder and rain? Second, God had made it thunder and rain in a place that rarely gets thunder and rain. Remember what we said earlier about the rain in Jericho? That area only receives about four to five inches of rain per year. And when it comes, it certainly doesn't come down like this. But before I can tell you about the third reason, I want to point out something about the passage. Did you notice the question that Samuel asked that seems totally out of context? Is it not the wheat harvest today? Why did he ask that question? Well, it's because the wheat harvest is usually in May. By that time, the latter rains have ended for the season. Why did this event have such an effect on the people? First of all, God made it rain. Second, God had made it rain in a place that rarely gets rain. Third, God had made it rain in a place that rarely gets rain at a time of year in which it never rains. And that's why this had such a profound effect on the people. God's Word is beautiful. But what is really interesting is that the more deeper you dig, the more beautiful it becomes. Digging Deeper is a production of Appian Media. We're a nonprofit media production company that is 100% crowdfunded. If you're interested in learning more about how you can support Appian Media so we can continue to create more great and free content, visit us at appianmedia.org slash digging deeper. If there's anything you need to reach out to Barry and I about, you can reach us at dan.kingsley at appianmedia.org and barry.brittonell at appianmedia.org. Both of us would love to hear from you and answer any questions you might have. Special thanks to both Stuart and Craig and Jet and the rest of the Appian Media production team who are doing their part to make this a success. Join us next time as we visit with Tim, Manna, and Riley Jones, who are friends of ours from Auburn, Alabama. We had an opportunity to spend some time with them in Israel, and we'd like to share part of that discussion with you. Until then, thank you for joining us, and we look forward to being with you on the next episode of Digging Deeper. Digging Deeper.